Okay, hello everyone. Uh, happy World Earthworm Day. Uh, and thank you to um, Kieran. It's nice to meet you, Kieran, finally. And it's nice to be reunited as well with um, uh, Rhonda and Mick, because I met, met Mick at um, BBC Gardeners World, when was it, five years ago? Five oh. years ago. Um, and I uh, got to meet Rhonda in 2017 um, when I um, uh, delivered some research at the International Vermiculture Conference, which Rhonda organises every year. I think she's on a 19th year now. Is that right? 19 years. Um, so that was probably the scariest experience of my life, but I survived. Um, so it's first just to introduce myself. So I run um, a, um, a social enterprise called The Urban Worm. And I uh, was set up in 2013, um, just after graduating um, in human security and environmental change, where really my eyes were open to um, the injustice of the food system and what a terrible state our, um, our soil was in. So since 1850, we've lost 83% uh, of nutrients in the UK due to industrial chemical farming. Um, and obviously everyone needs to eat and we're in a bit of a... Um, um, it's a tricky situation now in the UK we've got 30 years of topsoil left and globally it's 60 um, and we haven't been looking after our, our soil or our worms very well so I set up the urban worm and um, really as um, a way to connect people with the soil and nature but to build some resilience um, so obviously everyone needs to eat and we need the soil to feed us and to, in terms of nut um, nutrition and obviously we're in a the midst of a pandemic um, if, this, if the health of our soil is poor, then our health is poor. So, and obviously we get our nutrients from the soil. So it's, I think in 1975, if you ate an orange, um, you'll need to eat the equivalent of seven oranges now. So we really need to start looking after our soil health. So that's a bit about um, how the urban worm was started really. But um, what we do, we convert wheelie bins into, oh, one minute, is it working? Into worm farms. So I've developed parts, we use um, old for sale signs for, for drainage inside and we get the windows made um, locally um, in a local um, factory in Leicester in the East Midlands. And we run workshops for children, we work in um, community gardens, um, I offer consultation. Um, obviously a lot of that's having to go online now, but it's really about empowering communities and teaching people the power of the earthworm, especially as um, well, in terms of climate change as well. So um, food waste emits the greenhouse gases, uh, methane and nitrous oxide. And methane is 31 times stronger than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide is 310 times stronger. So by composting at home, it's just a really easy way that we can take some action. So here's um, a picture of my wheelie bin. So also um, this is a product that had some funding uh, for called Love and Compost. We worked with a social eating cafe um, and also an organisation called Pulp Friction who worked with adults with learning difficulties. And we, the, the, the beneficiaries were bringing in their compost to the, um, to the uh, cafe and we were composting it on site and also they were using the waste as well. So it was, it's gauging the community and we can all produce the compost together. So there'll be a harvest next year. Unfortunately, the cafe is not running anymore, but they are still doing um, delivery. So the worms are being fed. So, and this is a worm map. So if you go on my website, I've got a, a worm atlas. I haven't updated it recently to, to do that, but these are all the um, all of our worm farmers around the country and uh, some sites as well. So the Royal Horticultural Society now stock my worm poo, which I'm pretty happy with. Uh, so, and I suppose what the urban worm does all oh, go back is channeling uh, the power of Cleopatra. So Cleopatra was the first worm worshipper and she declared the earthworm sacred. And if anyone was to kill or an export an earthworm, it was a crime punishable by death. And now the Nile Valley is the most fertile tract of land in the world. So but we seem to have forgotten the power of the earthworm. So um, my uh, this talk is called um, Worms and Peace. It's a big theme in the work that I do. And there's a big history with war and the way we've uh, well, produced synthetic fertilizers. So in 1850, um, when the first synthetic fertilizer company was established in the UK by a guy called John Laws, which is now the Rotham Study Institute, um, uh, they discovered John Laws discovered a way to synthesize phosphates. 
um, but they still needed the, nit the nitrates that they were importing from an island off um, Chile and Peru, um, Chile and Peru, Chile and Peru um, for the um, guano poo, which is very high in nitrogen. So the UK government uh, funded Chile to go to war to take to take these the, the nitrates, and it was called the War of the Pacific, and it, it was 1879, and it lasted for five years. And then uh, um, afterwards, uh, 10 years, 10, 20 years, 10, no, 15 years, um, Fritz Haber, uh, who's a German Jewish chemist, discovered a way how to synthesize uh, ammonia to produce nitrates, but it's also the same process to make bombs. And the German um, chemical company, BASF, actually purchased, uh, purchased the patent um, in 1909, I think it was, just before, just in time for the First World War, um, to industrialize the process. And the process is called the Harbour Bosch process, and it was Karl Bosch that they employed to industrialize the process. And this process is the same way um, that we use synthetic fertilizer today. It's the same method, and it's very in energy intensive. And obviously nitrous oxide emits um, nitrates, it emits nitrous oxide, which is 310 times stronger than carbon dioxide. So it's a, a very destructive process and synthetic fertilizers are salts and worms don't like salt. So it hasn't been, haven't been too kind to, um, to the soil or the worms. And as a consequence, um, our, our health has declined. So, and it's quite a sad story as well. So Fritz Haber, um, he uh, he also invented uh, Zyklon, which was Zyklon B was used in the concentration camps. Um, but he actually he wanted to um, he wanted to fight in the Second World War because he loved his country so much. But obviously, being Jewish, he wasn't allowed, and he ended up I think dying alone in Switzerland. And also, his wife um, was the first uh, German chemist. Um, to gain a doctorate and she committed suicide because she was so upset with what her husband had done with his his talents and his, his son also committed suicide so a bit of a sad sad story there but Fritz Haber gained um, the Nobel Peace not the Nobel Peace Prize the Nobel Chemistry Prize um, for his contribution to food security also is also known as the father of chemical warfare so the history there for you um, what was it going? So, um, so we, but we don't need synthetic fertilizers. We just need worm manure. So this is actually, I had, I had this as um, my test. I also had this done at Laverston Park. Um, worm manure contains all 14 nutrients that plants need to thrive. And you only need a tablespoon per plant to this, uh, every three months, which releases the nutrients. Contains um, nat natural insecticide, growth hormones, everything that plants need to thrive. So there's really, we, there's, no, um, there's no necessity to be producing synthetic fertilizers. So, so vermicomposting, we know that the, the um, uh, vermis is from the Latin for worm. So we've got vermicomposting, vermiculture, and vermifiltration. Um, so um, as we know about vermicomposting and uh, vermiculture, but vermifiltration's um, a very interesting process, as to, um, a way to clean water um, using worms. So I know there's a company in Colombia called Aquaculture and they had some funding from Unilever of all people to, um, to trial a vermifiltration process um, that cleaned the water and then was also um, using the land on the farm to fertilize, to fertilize the fields as well. So vermifiltration, worms are very powerful. They're just cleaning, um, they're just filtration systems. Whatever passes through their body becomes clean. They even clean dog waste. Um, they're used also for um, uh, uh, the, other, the other term, vermiremediation. So to clean um, land that's been contaminated with DDTs and PCBs. Uh, there's a lot of work going on with the vermiremediation in India because they've had a lot of uh, problems with their, their um, DD. Had, yeah, they still use DDTs in, in India and Fortunately, he's uh, degraded their, their soil incredibly. So if we know our, our different, all this information is on the Earthworm Society um, website, but we use epigeic surface dwelling composting worms for, for vermiculture. And also as uh, Kieran was saying, with the composting toilets, um, Oxfam are now using um, worm composting toilets in refugee camps 
Um, so it's, yeah, it's really, there's so many applications that we can really harness the worm, earthworm to solve all our organic waste management solutions and turn it into something better. So um, irony with the worms and peace, um, I've been really, I'm very grateful. Um, I was uh, funded to travel to America and Cuba under the Winston Churchill Fellowship to research vermiculture. Um, I, I traveled the west coast of California, then over to um, upstate New York. I won't too, talk too much about some of these systems because Rhonda's going to talk about that. But um, one, um, one um, project I went to visit was in Monroe Correctional Facility. Uh, and this is, there's an interesting talk if anyone's interested from Monroe Correctional Facility, where they have a worm farm, it's called the power of sustainability. Um, and this, this is Nick, this is the uh, worm farmer in the head, head worm farmer in the prison and they're worm composting all of their waste in the prison and they're also using bakashi and black soldier fly larvae um, and then they're supplying the local uh, council with organic fertiliser. So the inmates uh, are being given meaningful activity and the council are saving money and also we're not spraying harmful chemicals in the community. So I think this is a really interesting project. Um, and well, sadly, I was due to start a project in April that was funded by um, the European Union uh, to deliver a project in three prisons, um, training people how to, to set up worm farms. And then we were going to deliver the worm manure to the local farms, but that's been on hold, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. But for me as well, the worm compost is a very practical um, application uh, for, for work, waste management. It's also about healing. Um, it's very spiritual practice. What it means, whatever whatever you've done before, whatever, whatever mistakes you've made, um, you can make them better because every day worms just clean and renew. They can turn toxic waste into something that we can use to feed us. So it's um, it's very it's it's very therapeutic. Now I've got my worm. I've got a mini worm farm with me here today. I like to keep my my worms in the house and and give me some peace. Oh, so, so, so that is Monroe Correctional Facility. This is, um, uh, so this is Mark Purser um, from The Worm Farm. He's quite famous. Um, I think he was on Blue Collar Millionaire uh, in the States. And yeah, very, very interesting character. So these are um, windrows, uh, really simple, low-tech solutions for, for worm farming. And most of um, Mark's cu um, customers are uh, uh, people within the medical marijuana industry and he's doing very well, he's a very interesting guy. So, and so this was um, when I went to Cuba. So I chose Cuba to do some research in vermiculture um, because this, the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Cuba were left with 80%, uh, without 80% of their imports and exports overnight. And they were um, using twice the amount of chemical fertilizers per hectare than the state. So they weren't farming sustainably at all. The Soviet Union are not um, famous for looking after their soil. Um, and as a result, when the collapse came, uh, their soil was very, very poor and the average Cuban lost 20 pounds. Um, so luckily um, the, the government supported the community and um, to, to grow food in car parks and that they taught people how to grow um, on national TV. So that was a big, as a huge effort, but luckily somebody had introduced uh, worm farming into the country a few years before the collapse. So they were able to scale that process up. Um, so this was um, in a work, this is a, a rabbit farm, which is 24 meters squared. Apologies to um, the vegans. Um, and this, uh, they were unable to, to farm this way by using vermiculture. So it was sanitary. So yeah, very interesting. But it's um, yeah, it really did. It has it did save them, and a, a ton of worm manure replaced the need for twenty eight tons of cow manure. So it really did. Um, it really did help. So this is um, this is in an urban farm in Havana. These are windrows, very low tech. I think there's actually a, a German charity that came and built these for them. But really, really simple, um, simple method of vermiculture, and they were using cow cow manure. So this is, oh, this is in, um, this is in the Philippines. I was funded, I had some funding from um, the international, the Department for International Trade to do some research. And you can see the goats were on the top and the, the goat manure was just falling down into the, into the vermi bed on the left. So very, very low, low tech. We don't need, we don't need fancy 
machinery. So, and so I'm a big advocate of um, low tech technology. So particularly Ernest Fritz Schumacher, who was the founder of um, the green movement really, he wrote a book called um, Small is Beautiful Economics as if people mattered. And uh, he advocated for low tech technology to empower people and to lift people out of poverty at a time when we were moving towards big, um, big machinery independent on, on fossil fuels. So these are two systems. I think these are the only two, everyone will have to correct me, but I think these are the only two um, Fermi tech systems that this guy made. Uh, one, the one on the left was at Santa Barbara College and the one on the right was um, uh, South Carolina. Um, I, I went to visit before I went to do the talk in North Carolina. So yeah, South Carolina it was um, a university hospital. And with these systems, both um, both had broken, uh, the parts had broken and they were unable to repair them because the guy had, well, they, they think had disappeared and they couldn't get the part. So this is why I'm a big advocate of low tech. So we can fix these things ourselves. And obviously it's cheaper. So there we go. And this is my, so very, very low tech. This is um, my small worm farm. So I rent um, a piece of land off a farmer um, in Car Colston, close to me. And I bought this, well, let's see that the, the, um, the vermi beds on the, on the right, um, just really simple breeze blocks inspired by the, um, the worm farms in Cuba. But the vermi bed, um, I bought that from, I put that from India and it cost 20 pounds, cheap as chips. The, the, um, so if anyone's interested in um, bulk buying, it was actually the, the shipping cost a lot more but it's a, um, a very efficient way. And on the side, you can see, we well, can't see, but there's air, um, air filters. So we don't need, uh, we don't need high tech, low tech all the way. And uh, there's, um, there's two cows um, on, on the land that, that live on the land where I have my worm farm. So I feed my worms cow, cow manure. So, and that is it folks. So thank you very much, worms and peace. Happy, happy World Earth Worm Day.